Uh, yeah, good morning or yeah, maybe good afternoon for some people, depending on where you are. Um, yeah, as Felicity said, I'm just going to run through the, the guidelines today. So there's two separate documents. We've come up with those. What, what I might first do is um, people who aren't familiar with them and the process we went through, I'm just going to run through a, a few sort of background slides on basically where we got to where we are. I might even pull up after those background slides before I jump into the first guideline and sort of talk about what detail and stuff's in it. And then I might get into a bit of the nitty gritty of the more technical bits of it. Um, and then before we jump into the uh, applicant guide then. So yeah, let's kick off. Eh? Um, so even before these guidelines projects um, began, we actually had another project with AgriFutures where we um, basically looked at all the state um, planning frameworks and sort of identified issues and potential solutions for um, development of new and expanding um, meat chicken farms. So yeah, there obviously was a reason for that because there was a lot of difficulties with trying to get farms approved. It was fairly timely and costly, ended up in um, yeah, civil arbitrations or planning and environment courts, which are the state you're in. Um, so we actually, after looking at that stuff, we basically travelled around the country, ran some workshops, got a whole bunch of industry and their government people in for some workshops and sort of asked them, well, what are the solutions to uh, fix this issue? And um, found there was pretty wide sets, widespread support for a, a national guideline for meat chicken farms to basically address some of the lack of supporting information on the, sort of the application assessment and approval process there. So that was that was a bit of a background before even we started developing these guidelines up. Um, so the guidelines, we really, and in that consultation, there was, yeah, pretty obvious odour was the big issue. Um, and so we knew that a fair bit of focus in the guidelines needed to go into that. And, yeah, also along that was some some duff stuff, but in terms of amenity impacts, odour was, was the big one. And then also develop a, up a, a planning and environment guideline for getting new and expanding farms approved, essentially. Um, so the project, so the process and stuff we went through. So on this odour stuff, we actually established a, a specialist like technical forum of some key air quality specialists. So people that we knew worked in air quality and particularly worked in meat, chicken farm applications, modelling, that sort of thing. And we put them together. We call them the, the odour working group, um, developed up guidelines for odour and dust impact uh, assessment. Um, and yeah, basically wanted them to work on that separate because it is a specialist area and we then wanted to include that in the guidelines. Um, and the other thing we did, we drafted up some environmental guidelines um, using the best guidance, you know, throughout the country information exists, looked at where the gaps were in that, you know, wanted to basically take the latest science because AgriFutures particularly had invested a fair bit of um effort and a lot of projects in the last decade or so on environmental management issues in particular. Um, so the other component of we developed up what we call the technical reference group. So after we developed up the draft guidelines, we wanted them to give feedback, feedback and expert guidance on those guidelines. Um, and then the next bit of the process, yeah, after we'd gone through that was a wider consultation process happened. So so the ODA working group, their um, key tasks um, were really, I suppose the word is consensus, get some um, improved scientific consensus around how ODA emissions uh, are measured, um, what are the ODA emission rates out of um, Michigan sheds, how you go about modelling that, how you determine those impacts, and also looking at estimating and modelling dust emissions as well. So we actually ran a technical forum with that ODA working group um, where we got yeah all these people together um, in the room, got them to pick their specialist area of expertise, um, presented on that um, and looked at which is the best approach for this. So, so we thrashed that out um, really to advance that consensus around those issues of ODA because particularly having these people in a room, they're the people we found, we sort of targeted people that sit on opposite sides of the a courtroom basically when there's a planning or um, environment court case or a VCAT or whatever it might be together. So we could, um, yeah, get their opinions and come up with some sort of consensus on that. So on the guidelines themselves, yeah, obviously there's state-based guidelines and stuff 
around, some newer and older than others. Most of them getting fairly old. Some states don't actually have any. We also had a national environmental management system that I'd sort of started on 20 odd years ago with Gary Sampson and that sort of existed as well. We certainly wanted to look at current state planning and environmental legislation and see how a guideline would fit with them. And we suppose we have a bit of an advantage. There was the other livestock, um, intensive livestock industry. So your beef cattle feedlots, um, piggeries, um, egg farms, and some dairy stuff as well. So they've had guidelines, you know, for 10, 20, yeah, probably in the feedlot industry, 25, 30 years, like a national guideline existed. Um, yeah, and then obviously using as a, yeah, all those research projects, we have sort of various standards and a very various bits of environmental management guidance around to, to draft up some guidelines. Um, so we put this te technical reference group together. So after we drafted the guidelines, we wanted them to, you know, they had a number of tasks to look at there was um, where there wasn't enough information in there to support the applicant and decision makers in making a decision on, a, on an application get some suitability on the approach and the guidance that we were providing and identify any additional research that's um, needed. So is these guidelines, were we really lacking any places that we needed to go do some more work really before we could put this in a guideline? Um, we got that technical reference group together for a two-day workshop in Sydney and basically have um, industry people there, regulators, local governments, consultants, to discuss basically those draft documents um, yeah, and basically work through them, all the, particularly the technical points or anything that they'd basically raised with us because they had the guidelines before the, work, the workshop um, and we discussed those issues they'd brought up there. So probably a, big, a main resolution that come out of that is we sort of changed the focus of the guide. Originally, when we started the project, we were going to have a like a design and construction type document and then an environmental management document but yeah, it really came out we need to write this for the audiences so that's why we ended up with a you know a planners like assessment guide and um an applicant's guide so that was one of the big outcomes that come out of that besides all the technical components it's about how we presented this information for the audience which yeah that's probably a bit different to a lot of the other national guidelines you might see are around the pace like for instance the feedlot industry has a code and then they have a, a guideline that's separate we have sort of two guidelines we've come up with but written particularly for two different audiences the assessment guide um so this is probably the the document where we wanted to get all the information in together to go through that people would need to look at to do an assessment of, of a farm. So all the, particularly all the bits that you would um, an assess a farm against. So just on the contents, the main sort of contents, I'll dig down into a bit more as we, as we go through the presentation. Um, there was, uh, yeah, obviously it's a bit of an introduction, a bit of a purpose and stuff that I'll talk about and what the scope of that document and stuff is. Um, we thought it was, yeah, basically had some feedback and it was probably pretty useful to put in there because knowing that, you, you know, if you're a planner or whatever in a council, you might not have been to a meat chicken farm, not really know how it operates, not really know how the industry operates. So we've certainly put a chapter in there to explain what are uh, meat chicken farms. Um, We've got a chapter on sort of strategic planning and approvals process. So this is probably a bit different to a lot of other national guidelines and stuff that I've worked on or that I've seen is that, yeah, the industry was pretty keen. It's really just the way the industry structured to have stuff in there around strategic planning because, yeah, it, particularly with the... Um, the chicken meat industry you know that when they go to a particular area there's like quite a big investment in there so there's a, a processing plant there's a lot of farms go in that you know can be quite large farms with many million dollars of investment in sheds so it's a, a plan if they're going to go into a new area or expand in an area it's um yeah a big strategic decision so we thought it was probably useful to put some information in there particularly when local governments are updating their planning schemes and stuff, they can draw on a bit of that in, the information of what the sort of things that industry needs. So I'll go into that in a bit of detail. Um, and then probably the guts of the documents is section four and five. So four is around the location and design of the farm complex and infrastructure. So 
this is like the building of it, the design of it, and you know a lot of stuff you're putting in an application. And then then there's a bit of detail in there about managing farms as well. Uh, there's a whole bunch of appendices in there. I'll probably yeah focus on yeah the first three of those. So obviously this odor was a big issue. So rather than develop up a separate guideline, we've incorporated the odor in and dust impact assessment into this into this document. Um, so that's in Appendix A, and then Appendix B deals specifically with if you've got to do if you need to do any odor modeling and stuff, what are the steps and processes you go through to do that in Appendix B? Um, and there's a surface wood and groundwater risk assessment tool, which I'll go into in a bit of detail because it's probably the other technical um, part of the document that may be interested in there. And then there's obviously a bunch of stuff that around the chicken meat industry research that I said they've done over the last 10 or 15 years. It's a quite a good um, reference source there that you can see all the work that's yeah, they've been done from environmental management systems to, you know, dealing with pests and insects and stuff and all those sorts of things. So we've listed all that litter management for farmers so you can find that sort of a, a quick reference guide um, for what the industry's been working on there. So the purpose and the scope of the, um, the applicant guide, it's certainly intended for use by planners, um, regulators, so and, and the developers of farms. So all their consultants are actually putting an application together. Um, so to prepare um, planning development applications and, uh, and have them assessed for any new or an expanding farm if you've got to go through that planning and approval process. It's important to note, and we note this in this guideline, because it's a national guideline and you know, as we know, um, the last couple of years, every state's different and they all have different rules. Yes, there's still rules and different EP acts and different planning acts in each state that you still might have, to, um, you not might have to, you will have to still um, deal with those and also the ones at a local level. So your exact planning stuff. So we can't actually write a national guideline that includes everything that's in every planning scheme and every EP Act in Australia, but generally they have a lot of the same principles in, which we, which is what we've got in here. So, but it's just a note there that, you know, we can step you through the whole process here, but just be mindful that a different planning scheme may have something different in it that you may need to address or a different, or there may be something different in a different state you've got to, you've got to address. Um, so the other purpose is, is I brought up a little bit, as local and state government may use the guide to inform their future policy settings or support their development assessment function, um, particularly if they don't have existing stuff or existing provisions and stuff in there. So, yeah, like, as I said, when planning schemes are getting updated, like um, councils and stuff are looking for, you know, the most up-to-date information and the science behind things. And, yes, here we now have a document that they can go to and can help inform that. Um, even with state governments that, yeah, there have been um, state-based guide, guidelines and stuff around before, and but, yeah, they've basically come out of date and redundant and they're sort of really not operating with much of anything anymore. So now they've got a national guideline that they can refer to or even states that have, you know, got a code of practice or a guideline, you know, they go to update that every few years. At least they've now got a document that they can go to to help them to help them with get that latest information and stuff on there for the industry if they're updating their code or whatever. For example, in Victoria, they have a code of, a code of practice that's incorporated down there for poultry farms. So, um, so this this these two documents will help help inform those those things if they continue to have state based ones that you know we can get a bit more alignment here. That if we can keep an up to date national guideline going, um, just on what the guideline refers to, so conventional um production birds housed in sheds and free range um so while the guideline has a general environmental principle principles that are relevant to what you might see so these small mobile production systems or caravan systems you might see they're a bit unique in their design that I mean they might have measures detailed that, that they won't actually apply to them so it's pretty difficult to write a guideline that fits fits everything so this is really for you know conventional production large sheds whether they're tunnel ventilated or conventional most will obviously be tunnel ventilated and free range ones there but not not necessarily the small um small mobile ones there's probably 
extra information in there the, with them and how they op operate that wouldn't be covered by these guidelines. But as I said, the general environmental principles around nutrient management and stuff are covered in this guide. Um, yes, as I said, there's a, a chapter in there on meat chicken farms and the, the whole of the production system. And that's re re yeah, really, as I said, to help people out who are not familiar with the industry, how a farm operates, how the whole, whole industry fits together. Um, you know, a bit of discussion around sheds and tunnel ventilation and how that works. Yeah, obviously covers everything on a farm that might happen on a farm as well. And we've also put some links to some other useful information in there, particularly the uh, Australian Chicken Meat uh, Federation has some good videos and stuff in there that, yeah, if you want to become more familiar with a farm, how it operates, yeah, I recommend you jump on there, have a look, um, and that'll give you that. And there's also good stuff on there and actually farms itself on their website as well. So, yeah, there's plenty of stuff you can see. There's, you know, plenty of fact sheets and information in it, yeah, videos on there where people actually step you through the day-to-day -day of running a, a chicken, uh, a meat chicken farm. So, so yeah, there's a, a few pages that helps cover that, as I said, and, yeah, links to other information and stuff there. Um, yeah, the ch chapter on strategic planning. So I've thrown that slide in on the left because I really wanted to tell you what the probably one of the drivers for this is. If you have a look on there, chicken meat, production is just steadily grown for the last four or five decades at like you know two and a half or three percent a year essentially that means we need more birds in sheds so we need either bigger sheds or expanded expanded more sheds on farms or new farms to keep up with that and obviously there's that increase in production but then obviously older sheds that were built 30 years ago need to be updated as well so there's there's always this been this demand and can um, continue to happen for um, needing further production. And yeah, there was a fair few stumbling blocks with that basically, which was um, causing a bit of angst on, on both sides. So that's why we ended up with this um, national, gui national guideline. So we've got some stuff in there on round strategic planning, talking about really what far farms need and when, um, councils and stuff are looking at updating planning schemes around zoning. Um, if they've already got an industry there, you know how you know these do generate some do generate odors. So you, you don't necessarily want to be putting um, rural um, residential and rural residential developments close to them because that's only going to cause you a bit grief further down the track. Some stuff on biosecurity, which is a bit interesting. There's the industry and the egg industry also have biosecurity manuals and stuff. Um, they don't actually talk a heck of a lot about separation distances and stuff in there, but in this guideline, we have put some you know, information in there around um, biosecurity. So, you know, how far they need to be away from other poultry farms and stuff. So, and you probably even need to think about that from an urban or semi urban areas and stuff with people who want to run poultry farms. And yeah, there's obviously big investment in having farms, particularly on the, if you've got breeder farms and stuff. So having to think about that in terms of, the approval process if someone comes in and wants you know an application for a new farm to know what they've got in their area and uh, to have a think about that from a strategic planning point of view from a council perspective um obviously yeah waters water and power are key things to running a farm so obviously access to good and reliable sources of those um and then obviously access to market so obviously where chicks come from where fresh bedding and litter comes from and yeah, where the processing plants and stuff are, as I said, it's a sort of a regional investment to get in this. Most most farms are within you know two hours um, of a processing plant um, for welfare reasons. So just to cut the birds to the plant. So obviously then you're going to end up with a whole bunch of farms. You need a, a lot of farms to supply that um, processing plant um, to obviously make it viable um, in a certain region. And then also spent litter utilisation. So how we basically obviously got litter there, we're bringing in feed, generating manure. How do we make sustainable use of that spent litter, get that back onto cropping land and stuff and reuse that in a sustainable way? Um, right, so get on to the content. Yeah, so this is sort of the, the guts of the... Um, 
the applicant guide, which I'll I'll talk about how we set that up essentially to start with before I get into the detail that's in them. So for this one around location and design, it, every single um, criteria you're looking at there, whether it's odour or, you know, surface water or groundwater or traffic, we have a whole bunch of things to basically test that again. We have a performance goal there, which is really the required performance outcomes for that ex activity. Um, so basically you're trying to minimise an impact on the environment, whether, that, as I said, that's water, whether that's odour, that's dust, that's noise. We've got mandatory criteria in there, which is simply about meeting, you know, you've got to meet your state-based regulations and stuff in there. So there's criteria that you basically, you've got to tick that box. Um, there's obviously stuff around siting. So there's some siting criteria in there um, for siting the farm and any farm infrastructure. So you know, the things you need to do there basically to get back and meet that performance goal. We've got some example siting measures in there. So example of, you know, these best practice measures to meet that goal um, and the mandatory criteria as well. But also keeping in mind that, yeah, there might be, you know, we've put some examples in here, but there might be alternative measures there that can be implemented that basically achieve the same goal. So keep those in mind as well, because obviously you don't want to stifle innovation and stuff where you might get a, the same outcome or even a better outcome um, with, you know, advances in technology and stuff, which is someone thinks of a better way to do it that we haven't thought of. There's similar to the siting, there's a design criteria there and also example design measures covered in there as well. And we've got like alternative design measures again, the same as the um, siting ones that, yeah, if there's a better way around doing it, yeah, go ahead. The whole, the whole thing is about achieving that performance goal. So the sections we covered, there's 10 of them in that location and design for a farm. Um, yeah, obviously an important one up front from um, a local government's perspective is does it basically meet the, the planning scheme suitability? Is Are you putting this farm in the right place? Um, there's obviously quite big ones around odour. So amenity impact. So that's your odour, dust and noise, the things you need to achieve there. Um, there's a section on visual impacts as well. So visual amenity, uh, traffic, uh, cultural heritage, flooding, um, bushfire, as I said, biosecurity, we've actually covered this in this guideline as well. So it's got, you know, some recommended separation distances in there for biosecurity to other farms. Um, and then your sort of natural, other natural resource impacts you got in there, like your impacts to land, surface water, groundwater. So what performance goal do you want out of there and what are your um, des design um, and siting issues around that to um, achieve that? Um, I'll get in, there's an appendix later on, I'll talk a little bit more about as well. And then flora and fauna impacts and stuff as well. So really all the stuff that you would normally be requested, you would see, you know, in an EIS or an environmental um, um, assessment that you would need to do. These are the, we're trying to cover all the things in there that would obviously you would be asked for in there as part of an application. Um, and then, yeah, the next guts of the document, obviously, so we've got a design and siting section, and then we've obviously got a management section. Again, performance goals in there is, you know, what do you need to do to minimise impacts on the environment from a management point of view? Um, so there's obviously the same mandatory criteria. There's management criteria and example management measures and stuff that you need to go through there as well. And again, alternative measures you can put a set. But I suppose a good point here is um, we've sort of we've tried to build this or we have made this document, but certainly risk based. So you will notice a lot of risk type stuff in there and how you go about assessing the, the risk that a farm might be. So we're trying to get away from just a, a generic. This is how it's got to be because a heck of a lot's to do with your uh, your siting, the design of operation and where you put it in and what your risks might be that be there you know whether you're free range or not and whether you're using litter on the farm or not and trying to do some of those things about assessing the risk and and yeah and what management practices then you need in place based on your level of risk so in that chapter five again obviously the ongoing management of farm will be around amenity impacts the odor and dust how traffic's managed visual amenity how your chemicals are stored and use um, pest management, um, 
land service and groundwater, particularly, yeah, if you've got free range operations or um, you're spreading litter on farm, that's obviously a lot more applicable than if it's a just a conventional shed where the birds are inside. Um, talked about environmental man management, environmental management systems. Um, and then basically how this whole thing fits with your farm management as well that's covered in there, you know, fits with your biosecurity, your animal welfare, and how you might want to integrate into that, your quality assurance, your quality, quality control systems that obviously farms um, need to have. So, so that's chapters, yeah, sections or chapters four and five and the things that are actually covered. And then, which I said, is the whole, really the guts of the document that's got the assessment process process in it when you if you have an application these are the it's pretty clear these are the things that i've got to try and meet and then the assessor can have those that so they're talking off the same page that these are how i'm going to assess that against um yeah so it's worth me talking about just briefly i can't get into it in great detail or you haven't got all day about um, odour and dust uh, assessment. So Appendix A basically covers that and, and really the guts of that is around a, a tiered approach essentially, which you, you've probably seen before in other guidelines and stuff um, for other intensive livestock industries. So the first tier is generally around and that's what we use to fix separation distance. So what we have is basically just a minimum distance that you need, need to be away. We've only picked two categories essentially there. Um, Basically, if you're, if you're putting this in um, a zone that's compatible, so essentially we're talking there, it's a poultry farm, you put it in a rural area, so you need to be at least 250 metres away from the, the boundary um, from your sensitive use um, from your neighbouring property. Um, if it's a um, land that's not compatible. So essentially you're talking about residential or rural residential that you need to be five, 500 metres away from that zone. Um, you might see other guidelines, you, know, you use three or four or more. I think the feedlot's got about 10 or 11 different ones in there, but yeah, it could become a bit complicated to try and, to try and look at that. So we've stuck to essentially two different, um, two different sorts of receptors, if that's what you want to call them. Um, for that, for your measuring your distance, which will become a bit more relevant when we have a look at that separation distance formula, which is the, the tier two approach. So that's a, um, a formula that's yeah, obviously fits with the meat chicken industry, but it's something that people who have had to deal with um, looking at separation distances with other intensive livestock industries won't be unfamiliar with. It's essentially a formula that's trying to calculate distance, you know, to your nearest receptor um, based on what we call a bunch of S factors to do with what the topography, what the wind might be, all those sorts of issues between where the odour source is, i.e. the poultry shed and the receptor. There's a little bit of stuff in there on dealing with how you go about multiple odour sources and looking at cumulative impact. And then tier three, so you have to go to a um, detailed modelling like plume dispersion. There's a whole chapter of a whole appendix there, you know, 20 odd pages on that plume dispersion modeling. So that's the separation distance formula. Yeah, as I said, you'd be pretty familiar with it with other industries and stuff. You've seen it before. It's got a bunch of S factors. So as I said, S1 is that sensitive land use factor. Um, so it's got different factors there for S1, depending on if you the neighbor is a rural house or if you're next door to a rural residential development. Surface roughness, this basically is around if you have trees and that sort of thing there, which essentially disperses the odour. So there's a, a bunch of categories in there for that. Terrain, again, about how odour is dispersed within the terrain, um, whether you might get sort of catabatic drift or is something that people might be familiar with that the odour might move down. So, yeah, basically changing the separation distance based on on your surrounds um, we also have a locality climate factor in there which you may not have seen in other formulas but yeah in developing up this formula we obviously um hunted around and got ourselves access to a, a whole bunch of odor modeling approvals for farms and also looking at um complaint history and stuff from all the states that were in um, local governments that we could get data from, which uh, helped us help us define a locality climate factor as well that we can put in there. 
um, there's an optional win frequency factor because it does, we say it optional because it does require a bit more work to do that. You have to get a hold of a, an hourly MET file for at least a year um, to come up with um, some wind speed and direction stuff out of that file. And you would yeah, probably need a third party, obviously, to help to assist you with that. But it basically just helps you get an extra step towards a an answer that you might see if you've gone into a the tier three approach of, of ODA modelling. Um, so, yeah, I won't cover these in great detail because, we, as I said, we don't have a lot of time today. So, yeah, there's the receptor type factor that I was talking about. So that's your sensitive land use. The surface roughness, yeah, changes with how, how much timber you have, whether it's just short grass, whether you have undulating hills. Um, the S3 factor, as I said, is around terrain, pretty obvious. Yeah, where you've got valley drainage and stuff, whether it's flat between the odour source, i.e. the sheds and, and the receptor, and then a local climate um, climate weighting factor there as well, which is to do with rainfall and humidity um, that we've put in there as well. So, yeah, Appendix B, yeah, which was, we developed that up from the ODA working group. So the people, as I said, you know, we got together all the experts in this, got them to write some technical chapters. Um, so that appendix, yeah, it's pretty lengthy and it's fairly technical, but it's there for a reason because it, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get consensus out of this. And yes, you can go to modelling, but people want to use different inputs to the model. So we got some consensus about what are those things to do with modelling? What are how do you go and calculate emission rates from a shed? So that stuff's all in there. How do you go about doing the model? How do you select the model? What are the switches and settings you use in the model? Um, um, how you evaluate the results and report the results. So I've got that all built into an appendix um, appendix now, basically from yeah, getting these experts together to come up with this. Um, the other probably technical part, let's just say a bit more technical part of the guidelines is we've got a risk assessment process for essentially deal looking at nutrients and if nutrients are coming off. So as I said, we're not going to worry about um, birds that are in, inside all the time. It's This is just to do with range areas and if, you're, if you reuse your litter on farm, your byproducts on your farm. Um, We've used this in the egg industry before. Um, yeah, obviously modified it a bit more again. Um, it was originated from a, something that was developed in Victoria called the Farm Nutrient Loss Index that they developed up for dairy farms. And we basically adapted that to, um, to work here for range and byproduct use, reuse areas. Um, so yeah, used a, yeah, their Farm Nutrient Loss Index, the soil loss equation as well to come up with this risk-based approach. So the, the probably the big thing to think about why we've gone down this is that each factor um, has a different basically importance to the risk. So it doesn't just try to look at distance alone, for example, to a surface, surface water as, you know, you have to be 100 metres away because, you know, in that 100 metres, you could have a whole bunch of vegetation or you could have bare soil. They basically have different risks. So we try to put the relative importance of those types of things in there to come up with an overall risk and then obviously um, what sort of management and stuff you need behind that. So that's a bit of it. That's the surface water one. So that's basically the summary of it all. The guy... The appendix includes all the detail of how you actually come up with those factors. But, yeah, just for surface water, for example, we have a rainfall factor in there, which, yeah, we can see there's a map of Australia which helps you pick your right factor, your distance to your waterway, your soil profile, so whether you have, you know, what the infiltration is like on that soil, the shape of the land, so whether you get, you know, converging flow and stuff or not. Um, Ground covers, obviously, in there as well. The slope of the land between you and the, the surface water. Um, we've got different factors in there for range areas and byproduct reuse areas. Um, then particularly around phosphorus, so what your phosphorus levels and stuff in your soil are, and a thing called your phosphorus um, buffer index. So you'd actually have to do some soil sampling to... Um, come up with, with what, what the buffer indexes or look up some soil um, manuals and stuff for your area to see what 
you know, those typical, those soils would typically be. So, as I said, so then you're obviously coming up with a total risk score. So for each one of those factors, you have a score, um, see where you fit, you have a rating factor, and your risk factor um, equals your weighting factor times your score. So if you've got a, you know, if you're in an exceptionally high rainfall area, if your rainfall factor, so it would come out at eight, um, you'd be 20 times eight, 160, and then you add the next one on to come up with an overall score for that. Similarly for groundwater, but yeah, there's not as uh, a risk fact, a risk assessment in there. There's not as many factors. So obviously, again, some obvious things. Um, we've got a soil profile, so infiltration's a, a big deal. This is obviously reverse to surface water. So um, if, you, if, it, if it infiltrates quite quickly, it's a higher risk. Um, the depth of the groundwater is important. Again, the rainfall factor, so how much rain there actually is there, um, and the ground cover type, which is really, that's about how... Um, the depth of the roots and stuff on the plants that you would have in growing in that area to mediate any um, effects that you may have on groundwater. Again, you come up with a, an overall score. And then we have some risk. As I said, the whole document's based around a, a risk assessment. So you've got some low and high and what we call, if you end up with a 400, you probably need to think again, like it's really not an acceptable site to have a range area or a byproduct reuse area on. So that's, yeah, that's guide one, the assessment guide. Sorry, it's a bit brief rush through that. But, yeah, if anyone's got any questions about that. Um, Eugene, yeah, there are a couple of questions. The first one, Eugene, is have you presented the document to local government? And if so, what was their reaction in particular Queensland councils? No, I think it's, it's only probably been released a few weeks, I think, for Felicity. So, yeah, it's available on the website. And it's probably this is... This is probably the early introduction to it, I think, is, um, yeah, so this thing actually exists. But certainly we had local governments involved in the development of it. So, yeah, they might not have seen the finished product, but um, certainly along the way, right back from before we even started developing the document, we had, yeah, local governments involved in um in what they wanted, what they wanted to see, and then obviously shared drafts and stuff with them. So, yeah, we probably tried to bring everyone along on the journey. Not everyone, obviously, when you're dealing with a whole bunch of different opinions, everyone might have got in there what they wanted to have in there, but we certainly hope we've reached some sort of happy medium. So, yeah, sorry, I don't have any, I haven't had any direct feedback from any local government people yet, I don't think. Next question. Western Australia and Victoria don't support criterion odour modelling. Are alternative risk assessment tools provided? Yep. So in, yeah, in that um, guidance and stuff, we talk about other ways to essentially look at the risk of those. So, yeah, that, I noticed that's a newish thing in Victoria and WA. They, I'm pretty sure they still use separation distance formulas and stuff uh, supported down there and generally separation distance formulas come from the odor modeling anyway so the, the two things are basically linked um yeah and it was a fair bit of discussion along the way because we knew victoria and wa were moving towards that but yeah there is a tier two approach in there essentially if they don't want to use odor modeling in those states and there's other things other things you actually look at that talks about that as part of that that assessment as well Thanks, Eugene. And the comment was, yes, they still use SD formulas. Has there been any road testing of the risk assessments? Um, yes, we actually have done a bit of testing on basically when we were developing them, looking at uh, farms. And the other test, it's quite similar to a process we used, we developed up for the egg industry. So particularly you would see a lot more free range operations there and probably bigger farms where they reuse their manure on. So yeah, we actually were able to do a fair bit of testing on that, albeit a, a different industry, a fairly similar type industry, if you know what I mean. So, yeah, and that basically helped us obviously tweak this thing to make it actually look like it works and stuff. Yeah, basically put it to the test on those farms. So, and certainly people have been through the process in the egg industry of using that risk assessment tool or one very similar to it with the approval process there for egg farms. I live in an area of high rainfall but low impact from rain. 
That is, we get floods most years, but it is not a disaster because we have a metre of grey loam and a low level of human settlement. How does your process, which you have explained, take this into account? Yeah, I think we're talking about the odour odor stuff there. So, yeah, the odour, so there's a whole bunch of um, factors and stuff in there that we try to take into account. So it is not... Yeah, I think we're talking about probably around about that rainfall factor. And that is really for quite low rainfall areas. That So we looked at odour, um, uh, what would you say? I'm trying to think of the right word. So sort of complaint data and stuff from areas, particularly like around Griffith and in South Australia, and looked at the separation distances and stuff that they use there for farms because they do have a formula down in South Australia and New South Wales they were using and yeah particularly around those areas that are quite dry and have uh, low humidity and stuff because they're the drivers for emissions from the shed really it's about litter in the shed which is a whole subject we won't get into um, which generates the emission rate so um, if you in it's basically just a cut off a cut off there that if you're low if you're average if you're very high you'll get a number but then essentially you get lower factors if you have lots of vegetation around you or something. So it's it's really just looking at how um, your surrounds and stuff, what the impact's likely to be at and, um, your neighbours. That's how the formula tries to do it without getting into a, a very detailed odour modelling exercise. So it'll give you a similar answer. Hopefully, in most cases, probably a little bit conservative because you imagine we're trying to do a formula that's, you know they can't actually completely mimic a very what a very sophisticated model can come up with um so it is got to be a little bit more conservative by nature so yeah hopefully i've answered that question i'm not i'm not quite sure if i have but um yeah there is a as i said there's a whole bunch of factors in there and then obviously looking at wind frequency and stuff and where your particular neighbor might be in relation to you and what the the wind um the wind is in their direction and also the wind speed because there's a way with that S5 factor that you can um, remove a bunch of the, the data out of there. And that 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 wind frequency factor has been used in the pig industry for, for 10 or so years successfully with their guideline. I won't go into as much detail in the applicant um, guide because, yeah, really this is probably less written for planners and uh, regulatory people because, yeah, this was about this whole audience thing. We wanted to get, which is a bit different as well than other, a lot of other national guidelines, we wanted to really help um, industry step them through the process and all the things they need to think about before they even select a site or then start to write their application to basically have less of these hindrances you go through where you get things like requests for further information and then they're obviously the ultimate of ending up in court. So if we can keep some farms out of court, that would be a good thing. And a lot of it's quite often about this process and actually thinking about it and have you got the right side, have you talked to the right people, have you brought the community along with you? So, um, so yeah, so there's some got a chapter on planning and environmental approval. So that... Yeah, really this whole process of what you need to do before you even start, you know, turning a sod of soil. Um, what requirements you need. Obviously, it's a national, we try to do this a national guideline. So there are, you know, differences in different states, but they are, yeah, relatively similar because, um, yeah, probably they look at each other's information to write these, hopefully. So, yes, there are, once you delve into them, there are slight differences, but the overall guts of the, uh, of what you require is the same no matter which state you're in. Um, stages of the approval process, again, needs to be a bit generic here because it's a national guideline. Producer considerations, though they really are specific for producers to make sure you've sought about those things. Um, there's a whole section on there on internet resources, which I'll touch on, which is, gives you a whole lot of help um, for each state. And even if you're in a different state, you might find some of those resources are pretty useful for your state to explain stuff in the process um, that goes on. And then it's got a bunch of um, appendices in there as well, particularly for producers around, you know, that environmental assessment stuff, like what things you need to put in there and then really nitty gritty stuff about, you know, what you're going to do with your farm and manage it, nutrient management plans. If I've got to do one of those as part of an application, this is what it is. 
um, what's in it, you know, stuff around composting, vegetative filter strips, which we talk about as part of your risk assessment with particularly around surface water management, um, how you go about designing those properly. And then there's a whole list of the chicken industry, uh, meat industry research and stuff in there in a chapter as well, in an appendix, sorry. So yeah, intended to be used by applicants of new and expanding farms. Um, so yeah, part of the, if you're thinking about planning a new farm, the key steps in the pro application process, what information you need to pre prepare and include, um, where to find that information, um, how best to engage with government and the community. Um, so the really, the, really the guts of it is about thinking about all these things and not trying to miss anything along the way as I said, because you don't want any unnecessary holdups. We, as I said, you get asked for extra information, you forgot about something, or you forgot about talking to the right people, or you left this out, and then you end up at square one and start to go around in circles, which waste time. Time means money, and yeah, and obviously trying to yeah, the ultimate really was there was uh, the the pain of ending up in a, a planning and environment court, which is obviously timely and very expensive. So there's a bit of an overview of the, the planning and an approval process and environmental legislation that you're likely to see. Yes, it's slightly different in each state, but it's really quite similar. So you have your, your acts, you know, your Environmental Protection Act, your planning acts and stuff there. Under that, they have their, you know, their state planning frameworks and you drop down to like a regional and local government area where they have guidelines, um, codes and standard, including industry documents. So that's where they would actually refer when they're doing a planning scheme. They would refer to this type of document, and that and that is quite common that you'll see. You know, you read a local planning scheme. It says, you know, might talk about you want a, an egg farm. It'll refer to um, the egg industry guidelines. Follow that, or the pig industry guidelines. Go and follow that. So, at a local government area, you will see that sort of stuff. And then, obviously, they get down to zoning. You know, rural areas and stuff, and where the right zones are to have a, a meat chicken farm development. Um, then we obviously got the stuff around environmental legislation. You know, the things around vegetation, wildlife, national parks, cultural heritage, um, community amenity, biodiversity. Yeah protection of water and access to water. So water quantity, quality type stuff will be in there as well. Um, so yeah, key, obviously the types of approvals. So there's size, complexity. We talk a bit about those because some states, you know, particularly they have a different process. If you have what they call the state significant development, like it's very large, there's a different process that you might actually go through um, to do that. Certainly about trying to understand that pole planning system and, and why there are a whole bunch of layers and levels to it. Um, so, yeah, really important for um, applicants of developments and stuff, the things you need to do there. Um, not trying to get a job for myself, but plenty of people will tell you this. You need to engage a suitable consultant, the right consultant, and someone who knows what they're talking about to, to stop those holdups and stuff. Um, through the development. Um, yeah, determine a suitable region. So we talked about, you know, that regional issue about where do you want to go? Where's the best place to produce poultry? You know, which regions are a bit more receptive to having a farm there? Before you even get down, you know, you need to think about those things before you go and, get, go and buy a block of land. You've already gone and bought the block of land and then you're going to try and make it fit. We're talking about where well, you do the other things first and then you start getting down to a specific site you look at the planning stuff, obviously the environment, the amenity, and then the things about is the land big enough? Have you got access to power and water? And then, yeah, developing a lot of preliminary farm information, including like your site plans and stuff. And you're really wanting to do that before you actually put an application together. So then you've got something that you actually take to the community, to the local government and state government and say, this is what I want to do. You know, you tell me if this is going to work, what, what things do I need to address? And yeah, and then yeah, as I said, you need to do all of that stuff before you, and then you start putting pen to paper in serious earnest about preparing the application. So site selection, yeah, as I said, it's obviously very critical. Um, you've got your planning considerations, your natural environment, amenity considerations. We've obviously touched on a bunch of these as well. And then your additional stuff. So the stuff, you know, around your power, your water, your services, your biosecurity and stuff that you'll need to think about as well. 
So there is a fair bit of information in there, and that's the stuff we suggest you try and get a bit, get together and put that information together before you go to what we call, in different states, it's probably called something else, pre-lodgement consultation, something around those lines, where you basically go and talk to the agencies, the local government, the state government about this is what I want to do, and you're in community engagement. So this is about you basically have this information so you can actually answer the questions when someone asks you, well, what are you going to do about your mortalities or, you know, what are you going to do about this and that? You've actually thought about, you have a, you have a plan and stuff in place for those things. So you haven't actually written your application, but you basically know what you're going to do. So you can... So it gives the community and and the administering authorities and stuff some confidence that you know this thing's not going to have any impacts. So you might address those impacts as well. So your um, application requirements, obviously, there's basic information there around climate and zoning you have to cover. You obviously want a detailed description of what you propose to do, which you'll have all this part all already done because you've done that as your preliminary information and your site plans. Um, quite often they'll ask for like what stakeholder engagement you've undertaken as part of the application and you would include that in there. Then you get into the guts of it, really, the technical parts of it. It's like your, you know, your planning report, your environmental impact assessment. And then probably they're really going to be a whole bunch of technical reports or appendices that are going to come with your application and it depends what you get asked for. It's like, oh, it might be an odour report or a traffic report or a stormwater a nutrient management report. So they're your technical reports that um, basically support your application. But I suppose one thing I'd one thing I'd say on that is you should really look at the amount of detail you need. Yeah, like in your impact assessment, um, the level of risk. So you've actually done some sort of risk assessment, and the amount of information you should have have to supply and give should actually match match the risk essentially with that site. So obviously trying to avoid just a, a one-stop, it's all like administering authority asks for this long list of stuff. It doesn't matter if you're in the back of whoop whoop, um, they're asked for it and you somehow got to address it and spend tens of thousands of dollars on a, a consultant to do that when it really didn't need to happen that you've done a risk assessment. So you've actually done that assessment and you go back to the authority with that saying, do I really need to do this that you've got on your list? Just the approval process. I know we're getting a bit short of time here. Um, yeah, basically the stages. Now, a lot of these things have set time on them. They're like legislated times and notification and stuff. But the big holdups, I said, was say number four, they're further additional information. If you don't supply that additional, you know, they ask for additional, additional information because you haven't talked to the right people um, and you haven't got everything in there, that can be a big, a big hold up. Um, so, yeah, before submitting the application, make sure all the planning, environment, community issues are identified and addressed. And we've tried to put all the things we think you should, you should have in here. And again, it's certainly talking to a lot of people that good community engagement practices undertaken early in the process. Um, and you've actually documented them. So you can actually say, you know, in your application, yes, we have done them. We've talked to these neighbours, we've talked to this community, we have run meetings in halls. So um, there's, yeah, a section on the producer considerations. So, yeah, obviously all those important things we've talked around about land size, your utilities power, water markets. Yeah, thinking about your shed design. Yeah, thinking about expansion in the future. Make sure you don't actually forget about that. Um, is the land size big enough to accommodate that? Um, yeah, we've got a bunch of resources in this, and stuff in there. So these are like internet resources that you can find. So we've grouped them into a whole bunch of sections from stuff that you can find on the industry, what state ag departments have, like mapping services. These are very useful, you know, tools for in that planning phase to see on a good place to put a farm, like good information on planning portals in there, planning overviews. Um, if you're going to do one of these, as I talked about, this pre-lodgement advice resources, so the things that I had listed in there, um, some of the states have good information on those. Um, state meat, chicken farm development guides and codes, you know, similar to the you know, documents that we have here. And also state um, community engagement resources that exist as well. 
as I said, there's a whole bunch of other technical information at the back there and the guidelines so around, you know, environmental assessment because that's obviously a big part of the application, how you go about developing nutrient management plans, composting mortality, spent litter, designing vegetative filter strips. Um, and we've had a big focus on that as well and rather than just following, you know, that the council, whatever, wants you to build a dam, which has a biosecurity risk, you can get just as good of outcomes or better outcomes by looking at a vegetative filter strip, which doesn't have permanent water, particularly if you've got a free range operation beside you. So you don't have to necessarily, don't have to accept that you've got to put a dam beside the operation. There's other ways around doing it. Um, and yeah, that relevant research, there's a lot of good information and stuff in there of research that has been done in recent years. Um, so yeah, sorry, I'm really chewed up all the time there, Felicity. <laughs> no worries, Eugene. I won't let you get off without just a, a few more questions yep. before we go. Um, will the tier one setbacks be sufficient for big farms? Uh, no, they generally wouldn't. They're, they're really there because when you get to that tier two, um, as I said, it's at the tier two and that equation is based on modelling and stuff and modelling and things aren't what we call very accurate in the near in the near field, so close to that separation distance. So with big farms, you got, you're going to exceed those separation distances by a lot anyway if you're talking you know, hundreds of thousands of birds and stuff you're having there. They're really there, to, really about that whole small farm where it's really hard to predict the odour. And it sort of covers a bit of the uh, visual amenity impact as well. They actually get the farm away from people as well. So um, that's really what those those tier ones are there for. So, and the thing is you have to meet both of those. So, um, yeah, so they're there if you actually go through and calculate your separation distance with number two, that, you basically have to go back to number one and the idea is there the minimum separation distance you have to be. Thanks, Eugene. Uh, next question. Should councils consider equivalent planning requirements, that is minimum distances, cumulative impacts, et cetera, when considering developments near existing farms, um, that is rural residential DAs? What advice yeah, we, can you provide, for, sorry, for farmers who are dealing with inappropriate developments in proximity to their farms? Yeah, and I, I think that's why, I mean, this is a guideline and stuff, but that is sort of a specific reason that we put that chapter in there for like that planning process and stuff for councils and stuff to think about, well, if you've got that development development there you need to think about i think we're talking about reverse setbacks and stuff in there that councils in their planning schemes and stuff and when they're making decisions on developments they actually think about that as that as that pro process i mean we can't just stop them not doing it but we're giving them some good advice that these are the impacts you're likely to get you go and approve that you're going to cause a whole heap of pain for the farmers and the and the people who go living there if you go and approve the you know the wrong sort of development so i think yeah, I don't think we're going to solve all the problems, but I think at least getting that information there is that, you know, that councils can actually think about that and actually think about using those reverse setbacks is, is something that we'd be trying to encourage. Yeah. Thank you. Second last question. Is there anything in the report outlining that the examples provided are not in order of preferred management, that is hierarchy? Decision makers often pick the first example and say that's what they want, i.e. dead bird disposal mentions processing and rendering first, and then the decision makers expect day-to-days to be rendered. This is actually happening now. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit of an issue. but So we've tried, so I've been conscious about that, I think, when we've done it, that we talk about... Um, that's why we set the document up like that. That chapter four and five in the um, assessment guide is around a performance goal. So as long as you're achieving that goal, it doesn't. It you don't necessarily have to do it do it that way. If you've got that outcome, it's not causing any you know impact on the community, not causing any any of those other impacts. You can still go about doing that, and it's still an acceptable way um, way to do it. So that's. That's one of the reasons we set the, the document up up that way. Yes, there are probably preferences to do things like, yeah, you probably picked a good example there of, of dead bird management that, yeah, obviously burying them is probably a least preferred option, but 
you could probably still do it if you don't have any, if you can put a fair bit of effort in and you don't have any impacts from that. So, um, yeah, and we tried and we've tried to also put in there. The other thing is that you can accept alternative things. So there's things we might not even have thought in there. Again, it's about we've, we've put in there to say as long as you're achieving that performance goal that you can go about that and you can demonstrate it's just going to take you more work, basically, if it's not something that's standard practice or what we call good practice or whatever you want to call it, best management practice, if it's not there you just have to do a lot more work to show it, I suppose, and prove it to them that you're going to achieve that goal. Thanks, Eugene. And last question, is this officially released now, the guidelines? Yes, it's, um, yeah, you've got, I think you in your invite, you put it out there, in your Felicity, you've got the links to the website, you just click on there and, yep. and yeah, there it is. I don't, yeah, I don't know, AgriFutures, how many, I think, I might have got asked that question from Michelle about hard copies and stuff. I don't think I've answered that yet. I don't know if people want hard copies of it, but I suppose it'd be a good idea if people want hard copies, they let AgriFutures know or whatever, and then if they have to do a print run, then they then they can. Yeah, And that sort of brings you to, yeah, I suppose hard copies. People still do like hard copies and stuff, but I probably didn't mention here, like any of these guidelines, the thing is to keep this thing updated. So, yeah, the aim is to try and update it every five years at least like a major overhaul that doesn't mean that small changes won't happen particularly if we've got an online thing we can change those things remember it's the first one i'm not saying there isn't the odd decimal point might not be in the right place or something that's happened before but we can fix that up fairly easily but yeah a major overhaul to happen every five years is highly recommended